it's a great privilege to have Mark Halpern here, who is maybe known to you in uh, one of several capacities since he's a Renaissance man. He's one of the greatest American novelists writing today. If you don't read novels, maybe you saw the film based on one of his novels, The Winter's Tale, of which I'm sure you disapprove. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I can't too much disapprove because there's a clawback provision in the contract. What do, you, what do you get when you claw back? They claw back the money. Oh, I see. No, you don't want that. I thought maybe you could get something from Colin uh, uh, Farrell, Farrell or, okay. Well, anyway, but some of those novels, I'm sure what you have either read or heard of are Refiner's Fire, Winter's Tale, uh, the, the terrific novel, A Soldier of the Great War, memoir from the Ant Proof Case, which my daughter is enjoying right now, uh, Freddie and Frederica in the Sunlight and in the Shadow. He's, of course, a uh, renowned essayist as well. On the <coughs> strategic thinker side, you may be familiar with Mark Halpern's writings for many years in the Wall Street Journal. And more recently, his regular uh, back page column in the Claremont Review of Books. In the Wall Street Journal about a month ago or several weeks ago was your strategy for how to deal with the threat from North Korea. Uh, Mark is not only a theatrician, he's a practitioner because he served in the Israeli infantry and in, his, the, and in the Israeli Air Force. He knows the Middle East very well, as you shall uh, hear in just a moment. Um, also speaks Arabic. I understand. Well, you know it. 50 years ago. 50 years ago. 50 years ago. I, 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 could, I could watch the news and have a conversation in Arabic and okay. speak to diplomats, but I, I couldn't order a glass of water at a restaurant. And it's been 50 years since I could do whatever I can do. But it's, it's not safe to drink the water there, so you're perfectly <laughs> fine. Well, without further ado, uh, let me welcome uh, Mark Halpern to the podium where he's going to address the subject of unorthodox thoughts in regard to the Middle East military dimension. Mark, thank you. That's not uh, dementia, it's dimension. <laughs> uh, and you know, upon further reflection, uh, after I supplied this title, I realized that everything you're going to hear from me is actually quite orthodox. It depends upon your frame of reference. Uh, it's only unorthodox given the miserable record that the United States and Europe has compiled since the Gulf War, uh, that's what's 25 years. But in 1945, it would not, be, it would not have been seen as, as, as unorthodox at all, and uh, Marlborough would not have seen it as unorthodox, uh, nor would uh, Moshe Dayan. Uh, so, uh, you might, what you may, what you will hear from me may seem rather pedestrian from that frame of reference. However, there are a lot of people who, who would think it really, really way off the uh, reservation. I want to divide it, the, what I'm going to say, into three parts. The first is a, uh, a fairly brief, I hope, uh, uh, essay upon overarching principles and conditions which are now observed mainly in the breach. These are, Oh, I'm sorry. It, oh. Oh, I see. Okay, no microphone doesn't work except to the camera. Uh, the first is overarching uh, pr con principles and conditions which are now observed mainly in the breach. And then second, I have a few examples to, uh, to uh, comment upon. And then thirdly, uh, will be the third part of it will be necessary conditions precedent uh, in order to achieve success. So first, and it may seem quite obvious, um, are, is, is the question of restraints that you have to reckon with before you go into a, uh, a country, before you invade, before you make a policy, etc. We don't, we don't really address these things systematically, which is briefly, uh, the public and oft times officials uh, don't comprehend these uh, even when they're overt. When they're covert, uh, sometimes even analysts with security clearances short of cosmic 
don't, don't comprehend them either because they don't know what's uh, going on if they're covert. Uh, now, uh, the, the, we'll first talk about the overt ones. They're pretty obvious. The uh, fear of China intervening during the Vietnam War was probably at least half the, uh, what, what was responsible for any, any kind of uh, analysis of the Vietnam War. What's this? Okay. Well, that's so I can be heard in the back? Okay. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. No, they can't. No. Uh, wait. Is it on? Is it? It doesn't sound on. It is on. It's not on. Testing. Do you have the other mic? Is that, is that at all? There you go. You have to talk right straight into it. Oh, okay. All right. Can, is that it? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Yes, okay. Um, so there's a overt threat of a, uh, a major power which is contiguous to the area of operations. That's, that's obvious. Um, then the more obvious things are nuclear protected alliances such as NATO or the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and the, ne the next step down would be nuclear-protected sovereignties, such as India, Pakistan, Israel, uh, and what, the, what Iran and the DPRK are aiming for. The important thing is that not only to recognize these things when they exist, but what is pertinent to our operations in the Middle East is that we often don't recognize that they don't exist. So in their absence, we still behave with unnecessary limitations of our own efforts. And this is uh, one good example of this was, I think, in the 2003 Iraq War, when we uh, unnecessarily limited our efforts, and, and we did so for other reasons. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but if, without a systematic analysis of this kind of thing, then we go in with strengths that are either uh, too great because they, they are, they're subject to a threat from another uh, peer power or near peer, or too little because we don't recognize that that threat doesn't exist. Then there's a question of covert. Uh, when I was, in, uh, I was in Italy during the missile crisis and I was working unofficially with the embassy, and there was a kind of thing with the, uh, how you feel the outlines of the elephant. And the outlines of the elephant were that everything vis-a-vis -vis the uh, deployment of uh, cruise missiles in Comiso and the P-2s in Germany suggested that there was a secret understanding between the United States, Italy, and Germany, which was delaying things and messing things up. And this was, this was very obvious. It kept on coming up. So I asked the ambassador, you know, is, is there not, uh, do we not have a, a covert agreement with these countries so that such and such and such and such and such and such, and such you know, laying it out. And this was Max Rabb, I don't know if any of you knew him, but he was uh, such that he said, covert, no, 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 I don't, no, 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 I, I don't know about anything like that. I don't, he was very, he was very animated. Uh, and I never found out about that, and it's, it may have been something that even he didn't know. And jump ahead to the, to the uh, Gulf War, and the question in my mind was, why did Saddam release the hostages as quickly as he did? Because they were a major card that he could have played, and he was not shy. And then the second question was why we didn't follow through. There are all kinds of reasons given for it. But I had the opportunity to ask uh, President Bush multiple times about this. And he very calmly, unlike Max Rabb, just looked at me and said, no, there was, there was no secret agreement. Now, he may not have been telling the truth, but on the other hand, he wasn't lying if you know what I mean. Uh, then there are the uh, necessary uh, restraints, uh, depending upon your available resources, the uh, possible uh, conflicts elsewhere. So then you talk about division of your forces, um, the required reserves for things that are unexpected, and not least political restraints. And then finally, there's the the self-inflicted restraints in which I would put uh, catering to Iran's nuclear inhibitions as number one these days, and uh, opening the Middle East to Russia after 10 administrations kept it closed to Russia uh, as an extraordinary self-inflicted <laughs> restraint and almost self-sabotage. 
uh, that's as, as far as the, the uh, restraints. If we don't approach those systematically, and I can I guarantee you that in this administration now it's not being done, nothing is being done systematically because it's kind of chaotic. The next thing is war aims and strategic objectives. We tend not to have clear war aims. Uh, but on the one hand, uh, limited and reactive plans to solve an immediate problem, such as striking back at, at al-Qaeda uh, or cleaning out ISIS. And on the other hand, impossible and grandiose notions such as ridding the world of tyranny or transforming the Dar al-Islam to the Dar <coughs> al-Vermont. Uh, uh, the, uh, the former cedes the initiative to the enemy the latter is so diffuse as to deprive us of a proper focus. Without a war aim, you cannot have a successful war because you don't know what you're doing. And they also, wars that are, that are uh, commenced without war aims tend to go on forever. Uh, the second thing, which is subsidiary to war aims, is the strategic objective. We tend to think of strategic objective as a campaign strategy. In other words, it's the air campaign, and then what cities to take and what routes to take. That is not a strategic objective. Uh, in, the, in the case of the Arab world, we really would do well to focus on a, the much higher and essential objective, which is to flip our Arab uh, opponents uh, into fatalism. Fatalism. Yeah, this is something that Israel has always been uh, cognizant of, and it is it is a very very important part of their strategy, and any good commander would know this, um, but it's particularly relevant to the Arab world. And why is that? Well, you, first of all, you have to contrast uh, Islam's conception of divine action and will with the Judeo-Christian conception of divine action and will. In, in the Judeo-Christian conception, God makes rules that he abides. He, he will follow his own rules. He doesn't have to, but most of the time he does, even though uh, sometimes bad things happen to good people who follow his rules, but then you say he works in strange ways. There's an attempt to, to explain it. Uh, in Islam, Allah does not have rules. There is, of course, the uh, kanun, but that's different, that's for us, or for, the, for Muslims. The, uh, Allah himself is capable of creating and recreating the universe in nanoseconds, as he wishes. Nothing is certain, nothing is fixed. Of all things, he is not subject to any rule. Therefore, things are constantly changing. And when they constantly change, think of a, uh, of a totalitarian society or a prison where the rules are constantly changing, or when they go against their own rules. For example, uh, I was in a military prison uh, on, the, on the West Bank, and we were told, well, this, these are the rules, and then they would, they would change the rules. Or they, would, they would go opposite to what the rules were, and that makes you feel completely powerless. That's one of the secrets of controlling people, is you make rules, they try to follow them, and it doesn't matter. You execute them anyway, even if they're loyal people, the way Stalin used to do or Saddam used to do. But this is, uh, uh, without uh, you know, any pejorative connotation, this is one of the essential uh, planks of Islam, which is that God is constantly changing the universe, constantly making, and you are therefore completely subject to his will, completely. You, you, you must submit because you don't know what's coming, you don't know how it's coming, and therefore, anything that happens is his will. Uh, and if you can, if you can uh, show that, that whatever happened is, is, is Allah's will, then you have submission. Now, uh, I have to quote uh, T.E. Lawrence on this because he, in The Seven Pillars, he is, is magnificent in laying this out. Let me read this quote. He says, this people, meaning the Arabs, uh, was black and white, not only in vision, but by inmost furnishing, black and white, not merely in clarity, but in opposition. Unconscious of the flight, they oscillated from asymptote to asymptote. Now, 
T. E. Lawrence didn't know what an asymptote was. <laughs> he, I think he meant apogee and perigee, I don't know. And he's very charming because in his proof notes, when the editor says, that's not what an asymptote is, he says, well, I didn't know what an asymptote was, but everyone will know what I mean, so keep it. <laughs> and, and he does that throughout. And all his, if you look at the manuscript notes for the seven pillars, he says, well, um, okay, this is spelled this way, this way here, and this way there, and this, it doesn't matter, people will know. Uh, he's very casual about that. But anyway, uh, look, targeting enemy morale uh, is, is, is not exactly an unknown concept. Every good commander wants to do that. My point is that the nature of Islam and the Arab Middle East offers far more than the ordinary advantages in regard to this. Uh, and I would say further that defeatism's strongest levers, uh, other than Western elites, are to be found here in Islam. Now, I thought that we had uh, understood this with shock and awe, you know, when they said we're going to do a campaign of shock and awe. But uh, in, in so doing, we fell short, and we created a situation which is analogous to not finishing a course of antibiotics. Uh, what it did was it taught them, it taught our enemy, that we didn't wipe them out to the point where they were frozen and completely shocked, as in the 67 war, as to some extent in the, in the Gulf War. Um, especially had we continued. And they learned, well, if they just hang tight, they can keep on fighting and defeat us because, as everyone knows, they have a different time scale than we have. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like um, uh, negligence, really, not to understand this and not, and not to use maximum force. When you have a problem that you have to solve by force, uh, unless you're a... a cop and you're dealing with your own citizens, you have to, you have to use the, the maximum force which will achieve your objectives. And part of this is that we didn't really define our objectives. And certainly we don't know about flipping our opponents, the Arab opponents, into their fatalistic view of things. Uh, then there's the, 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 the principle of the organizing force. Now, as we all know, in the Middle East, there's a huge number of constantly shifting combinations, alliances, uh, permutations among not just nations, but sects, tribes, movements, uh, ideologies, etc. Much faster than the normal uh, fluctuations and changes in alliances among nation states. M much, much faster than that. Uh, anyone who observes the Middle East can see that. Uh, this means that the Western interventionist power must be sufficiently overwhelming so that the disparate components that we encounter there in the field of operations will adhere um, to us. That we can't be just another component. We have to be so much more in the plurality or a majority that there's no question as to whom uh, the, the various components will adhere to. In other words, we have to be stronger than any alliance that might occur to them temporarily. Uh, and we don't seem to know that, and therefore we often use insufficient force. Uh, for example, uh, in, in Iraq, uh, there is the myth of the surge. Now, there are a lot of myths that are politically convenient and that people stick to. For instance, the myth that Sacco and Vanzetti were innocent. Uh, they, people say, well, they were railroaded. Well, they were railroaded. They received an unfair trial from a judge who hated them. They were railroaded, but they were also guilty. This we know from the deathbed confessions of the, uh, their defense lawyer and from uh, forensic and ballistic evidence later on. You know, two things can be true at the same time. Um, another myth is that the uh, Reagan uh, defense expenditure plus tax cuts created the deficit in the 80s. Well, I've gone very carefully back to the statistical abstract of the United States and done the figures. And if you just deal with revenue, which is the result of any kind of tax policy, and military expenditure, and you put them together, what you get is a huge surplus. And yet, everywhere you can read, oh, Reagan made the deficits by cutting taxes and, and uh, boosting military spending. Another myth is the myth of the surge. 
and my colleagues at the Wall Street Journal are very fond of this, and it's one of those things that's repeated and nobody challenges it. I've always challenged it because I went to the official DOD figures about troop numbers in Iraq, and I discovered that in the period from uh, 2003 to 2007, that uh, the, uh, uh, the overage of the average number of troops that were there in that time during the surge was 12%. But if you then look at the number of contractors, and the contractors were our tail, and they were even more than our tail because they were doing force protection, and by, by uh, doing protection on the roads, they were actually in, engaged in, in combat. They were more than just tail, they were partly tooth, and every army has to have plenty of tail, um, no pun intended. Uh, then it's 7%. So how could 7% of this search. That's the miracle, 7% overage. Uh, that's, it, it was nonsense. The reason that, it, that the, to whatever extent the tide was turned, the reason that it was turned, is that the, the, the Sunni tribes decided that they would ally with us against the, the, uh, the, the Shia, and, uh, and rather than fight, fighting us and then having the Shia to deal with after, they, after we finish with them or they finish with us. And they simply switched sides. And, we, and the people that we were killing, that were killing us, we began to pay and arm. It had nothing to do with, a, with or very little to do anyway, with troop numbers. Uh, this, by the way, uh, reminds me of the thousand ship navy. You know, we used to have thousands of ships, uh, major combatants. I don't say major surface combatants because we also, also include submarines. Uh, we had thousands, uh, for, in the, certainly in World War II, and then in the, in the 50s and in the 60s, the Vietnam War. And by the time we got to 1980, we had far fewer than that, and then Reagan and John Lehman worked it up to 600 ships. Now we have 285. And what you read in the professional journals um, is that, is that we, the, the, the idea of the thousand ship navy and when I first saw the headline, I thought, whoa, this is great. You know, someone's advocating what we should do, which was we should build a huge navy so that the, the allied navies can adhere to us and they'll feel protected by us, and that's what you need to do. You need to have it, and then the rest is, is gravy. It's like what Napoleon said, frappez la masse et le reste vient par ce croix, which is uh, loosely translated, strike the center and the rest is gravy. So that we, we always should have that uh, independent capability. Then our allies will adhere to us and be that much stronger. But the thousand ship navy was our navy, which is vastly shrunken in size, plus all the navies of our allies. And this, the, the people tried to comfort themselves, you know, officials, the secretary of the navy, the uh, admirals, with, oh, well, we've got a thousand ship navy. This reminds me of what my wife uh, knocks on me about when uh, I used to try to calculate our net worth, it's very tiny, uh, and I would include the trusts we have for our daughters. And she would say, you can't do that. And I would say, well, you know, it's all, it's in the family, it's the family, it's the family. She said, no, 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 you can't do that. Well, that's the thousand ship Navy, what I was doing. And then uh, she cured me of that. She's a tax lawyer, uh, among other things. And, and, uh, and I realized that, well, we don't have a thousand ship Navy. That's, that's, a, uh, that's, that's an illusion. Okay, some cases. Uh, let's, we can get to the, uh, this, the second Iraq war. Phase one, which is the actual, this is 2003, the actual invasion. Uh, first of all, there is the myth of our great uh, uh, military prowess. Remember the, 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 the female soldier who was supposed to have been a great heroine, I forgot her name. Uh, Angela. Harry Angela. No, no, no. Jessica Lynch. Jessica Lynch. Jessica Lynch, right. And that turned out to have been a myth. I mean, there's public relations working. And one of the things in the public relations was that this was the fastest advance that had ever been done. It was just unbelievable, um, mind-boggling, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, I remember having dinner uh, alone with General Mattis, and because I was ignorant of the fact that he had led it, I didn't know that, uh, I criticized that advance in no uncertain terms. He was wonderful because he didn't, he, you know, he reacted to my chutzpah 
without, without any kind of impoliteness, and in fact, he, he agreed. Uh, when I brought up to him the following facts, uh, Lucian Truscott in Operation Anvil uh, cleared the whole south of France of Germans, and there were plenty of Germans in the southern provinces, and then got to Dijon, which was from Marseille to Dijon, which is the same distance as uh, Kuwait to Baghdad, in two weeks, not three weeks, and he was fighting Germans. Uh, Patton went from Normandy to Germany, and it, he got off at Avranches, and there was uh, a lot of supply came there, but most of the supply came from Cherbourg, which is way over in the west. He got from there to Germany, sometimes going 60 miles a day in six weeks, and he was fighting Germans. You know, really uh, very well equipped and experienced and tough Germans. And then, of course, there's a Six-Day War, in which the, uh, I was, I was uh, there, the Israelis uh, crossed Sinai, fighting through Gaza, urban area, the hardest thing you can do, uh, although they had air superiority at that point, having destroyed the Egyptian Air Force, just as we had air superiority, of course, in, in Iraq. But they were fighting an, a, uh, an army that was much richer in equipment, in armor, in numbers, in uh, fortifications, because they had fortified the Sinai. So they, they got through Gaza, and they, and, they, and they broke through the Mitla and Gidi passes, uh, and they did this same, more than the distance from Kuwait to Baghdad in, in four or five days. So I, I told this to General Mattis, and he could only agree, and he was, I must say, very gracious. So uh, I always had an alternate plan, even from the beginning, and nobody paid any attention to it, of course. <laughs> they seldom do. But here is my alternate plan. And this map is uh, Her Majesty's Stationery Office. Uh, I love the map. It's a bit outdated. Uh, as you can see, there's the uh, United Arab Republic, which went out of business in the middle 60s. Uh, but the, everything else is, is more or less the same. I got this map from Harvard because they give away these things, because they have, they have so much. They have a table where they, they put the things that they're throwing out of the library. And I got this and 10 others like it, magnificent, <coughs> terrific maps. But anyway, here's, here's my plan. Uh, what I wanted to do <coughs> was, first of all, to have sufficient forces. We didn't have sufficient forces because R Donald Rumsfeld uh, and Bush were thinking of this invasion as a, uh, from a business point of view. In business, what you want to do is do whatever you have to do with the least amount of expenditure and resources. And then the difference is your profit. Unfortunately, war doesn't work that way. So they, they decided that they would do this with the least amount of effort and forces that they could do. It's a, the wrong thing to do in war. You never know what's going to happen, and you don't have the advantage of the crushing blow, which changes the morale and the fighting spirit of your enemy. And that's one reason why we took three weeks to get up to Baghdad. So my first recommendation from the beginning was we need more force, much more force. We need a, a Gulf War force or something close to it at this point. And the second thing is what I wanted, what I recommended, and always thought it would be the best thing, would be to go to uh, Baghdad and spend no more than two weeks there, get a compliant general, of which there were plenty of candidates, tell that general uh, his forces preserved, this is your job. You want to remain a block against Iran, which uh, Iraq has been had been able to do for a long, long time. You want to uh, uh, extirpate your terrorists, any terrorists that you're harboring. Uh, you, you want to uh, be contained and not threaten any other countries, as Saddam did. Uh, and you want to act more decently towards your population and not be as repressive as, as he was. And if you don't do this, we will be back, and we will find you, and we will uh, dethrone you, and we will kill you. And then, here's what uh, I encountered as people really objected to. I said, and I still say, the American army 
is not an army that should sit still, never. You have to capitalize on your gains and you have to keep going. And then the, the spirit of the fight really, really uh, will, will uh, uh, invade your, your, the body of your troops. In Israel, there's a, uh, a famous uh, saying, which is, sa, sa, sa. It means go, go, go. Sa I mean, is when you say go in terms of driving. Cholech uh, is uh, walking. But when Israel will capture something, they say, sa, sa, sa. In other words, drive on, you know, and, and take advantage of your victory. What I wanted was for us to go from Baghdad to Damascus, 450 miles. There's a road. There's nothing on it to stop us. Nothing could have stopped us. And then if you had a, a Israel as your anvil to the south, and Jordan participated, Turkey as the anvil to the north, and of course Iraq would have been in our hands, then, and us in the Mediterranean with our allies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we could have uh, crushed the Syrians and done the same thing in Syria that we did that we would have done in, in, in Baghdad. Leave someone in charge, and there are plenty of, of among the Sunnah who would have been happy to do that. At that, I'm not finished yet with this plan, though, because at that point, what I've done is move the 600 miles back to here, which is what? This is called Hafar al-Batna, or Q5 and Q5 military city. There's a huge Saudi, and there was infra military infrastructure there, airfields, barracks, uh, munition storage places, pipelines for fuel and water uh, connecting to the sea. It's 120 miles to Kuwait port. It's an easy two days uh, drive to Baghdad and a little more to, to Syria. If you arrested the troops there and you say, okay, here we are, we're, rest we're tan, rested, and ready. You could call it Base Nixon. And uh, what would have happened? Well, for one, we would have had no insurgency casualties. Let the secret police of Syria and Iraq do the, the job against the insurgencies. They know how to do it. They've done it all the time. We would have no insurgency ca casualties. Therefore, our polity would have been undisturbed. And we would have spent far less money, too. Also, our relations with Europe would have been undisturbed. Why? Because our victory and our position well, would have been enough to give. Someone said to me, I don't agree with it, the, the slogan, you can't argue with success. Well, you can argue with success, but this kind of success people tend generally not to argue with. Never end a sentence with a preposition. Uh, so the, the, the uh, other possibility would be that in doing this, look at it. We would have controlled the center of gravity of the Middle East. And for one, we would have blocked the toxic Iranian bridge that they have built from Afghanistan all the way to the Mediterranean. Because we would have controlled these countries. And, they, and Iran at the time was terrified of when we invaded in 2003. It would have been a different story with them. We would have had much more influence on them. And we certainly would have prevented their, their uh, patronage of uh, Hezbollah and, uh, and, and uh, Syria. So the complexion of the Middle East would have changed. And we might have succeeded. Again, of course, it's all counterfactual. I don't, I don't know. But we might have succeeded in making an alliance structure that was lasting in the same way that the British were able to do that. Now, the, the Brit I, when I was in graduate school, I. Uh, studied among with many people, including Albert Harani, whom you may have heard of. And uh, in, in a, it wasn't in a seminar, but it was in a, in a class in Middle Eastern history. I asked him the following question. I said, Professor Harani, uh, we know that uh, there was a more or less Pax uh, Britannica in the Levant, and also French piece too, uh, during the 19th century. Uh, how many actual troops and, and what kind of military structure did they have to, 
to, to, to accomplish this? And he said, it's a very good question, and I don't know. And he said, I, I, as far as I know, I've never read about that. So he, he went away, and weeks later, uh, he had done his research, and he came back. And he said, actually, in 1840, there were 1,500 British troops, uh, and then this is in the Levant. In the Levant. And then in 18, I think it was 60, he said 6,000 uh, French, and it was temporary. So that very small amount of people, now this was granted as before T.E. Lawrence, it was before Mao, it was before Franz Fanon, it was before the modern technology enables uh, various uh, resistance and guerrilla movements. But nonetheless, if you play your cards right in terms of the metaphysical placement of your troops and the, the uh, effect on enemy morale and what you're willing to do and how fast you can you can, in the case of the British especially, reinforce them. Uh, if you do it intelligently with, with relatively little force and, and uh, s small uh, troop presence, you can control vast areas. For instance, uh, in, in the Negev, uh, the, I, I was once uh, curious as to how the British controlled the Bedouin, the Beidou, because the Beidou are notoriously independent. They don't bother with borders, and it's like, it's like a bandits or whatever. And uh, someone said to me, well, I'll show you how. And we went, we drove, and there was a well that was in the rock. And the water kept on dripping into this well. And he said, there had never been a well here. The British uh, drilled in, they blasted a, 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 a channel, and they built this basin. And here's where there was always water. So the Bedouin always came to the well and the British established a post nearby, that way they could monitor everything that was going on with the Bedouins. So it's a question of intelligence and how you, how you display your forces. Okay, phase two of the 2003 war, which was the, uh, the insurgency. What did we want to do? We wanted to control this area with a population of 24 million at the time. And, and with 100,000 troops, that was the plan. So what I thought was, and still think, that you should contrast that with another case. This case would be the West Bank, Israel's control of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, for those who are purists. Um, and I did the figures, and the figures are this. Uh, in, in Iraq, there's 170,000 square miles, and we were going to put 100,000 soldiers, so it would have been one soldier per 240 people per 1.7 square miles, as opposed to the West Bank. I'll just tell you what my product was rather than going through all the, the, uh, the process. Not one soldier per 240 people. This is figuring 30,000 Israeli troops that were uh, impossible, it was possible to immediately engage, to, get, to engage immediately in the West Bank. Uh, and of course, they could have many more because their whole army was right around it. But figuring that 30,000, uh, instead of one soldier per, per 240 people, it was one soldier per 40 people. Instead of one soldier per 1.7 square miles, it was one soldier per one in one thirteenth of a square mile. The U.S. Iraq ratio of disadvantage was six and 12 to one. In other words, six times more difficult in terms of uh, population and 12 times more difficult in terms of area to control. In addition, the West Bank was completely surrounded, except for the, at the Jordan River, and even then there was, there was an Israeli uh, blocking force there, it still is. Uh, so it's completely surrounded, as opposed to Iraq, which had open borders from, from Syria and, and Iran, where they got supply and forces, etc. The West Bank was completely surrounded. It had been occupied at that time for 37 years. The Israelis knew the language. They could speak the language. They knew the culture. They knew the customs. Um, and the question that I asked was, do you think that the Israelis are having fun in the West Bank? So how can we, who know nothing of the language and the culture, and have so much a bigger job, how are we going to put down an insurgency? And in addition, uh, the, the, in the West Bank, there were no heavy weapons. Whereas in Iraq, they had, they had tons of them. They buried explosives and RPGs, et cetera. 
And I made a further comparison with the uh, NYPD. The NYPD has 30, had, at the time, 37,000 uniformed officers for a population of 8 million. That would have been equivalent to 111,000 US troops to the Iraqi population of 24 million. Uh, and the, but the NYPD doesn't live at the end of a 9,000 mile supply line. They, they live off the land at Starbucks and Whole Foods. Uh, they also don't have to guard their enclaves. You know, you don't have, uh, except in the South Bronx. Um, and they also depend upon a civil order in the existing population, which is not RPG equipped. And, they don't, and in addition, they don't have to build schools or power plants. So what we were asking our forces to do was virtually impossible. And we solved it by the surge. No, that's only 7% uh, augmentation. We solved it when they decided to uh, do what they always do, which is to have a continual anarchic uh, change in alliances among themselves, in which case we were involved. OK, another uh, example is Iran. And I will be very short about that one, because uh, it, we all know about it. It's current. And I have a very, very long uh, lecture about that, which I've given around the country. And, I, and if I were to repeat it here, we'd be here until midnight. But briefly, I used to hope that George W. Bush's parting gift to the nation and the world would have been um, uh, destroying the, the Iranian nuclear infrastructure, which he very well could have done, which we could do now, which Israel, however, taking an existential risk, also could do now. Uh, but he, we didn't, he didn't do it, and God knows Obama didn't do it. Uh, there would be repercussions. Well, the repercussion that's, that's, asked, that's mentioned mostly is that the Iranians would be mad at us. <laughs> really, uh, they're already mad at us, and uh, they, they do about whatever they can. So that wouldn't be much. But the second repercussion would be the war in the Gulf, the tanker war in the Gulf. We have had one before in the 80s, uh, and this time they're better equipped, but we would have to scrub the Gulf, which we could do. It would take a long time, but we'd have to hit all their their surface-to-surface um, uh, -surface missiles, anti-shipping missiles. We'd have to destroy everything along the coastline of the Gulf. Uh, that would be a war, and we, a war that we could fight. The second possible re repercussion would be the uh, tinkering with the, uh, or you know, uh, disturbing the mutually assured destruction uh, dynamic between Saudi Arabia and Iran. In that, uh, they both have very vulnerable oil infrastructure, and that's obviously totally essential to their economies. You destroy their oil infrastructure, you destroy their economies. But there are a couple of things there. One, uh, the uh, Saudis are far more able to defend, especially with our help, than the Iranians would be, so that the Saudis would suffer less damage. Uh, two, they could reconstitute much faster than the Iranians. Uh, and then the third thing is the uh, people would say, well, what about the Iranian, um, uh, the conventional forces that might invade uh, Saudi Arabia? Well, it's true now they have a foothold in, in Iraq, where they didn't then. Uh, earlier, but in fact, there is tremendous overall Saudi superiority, conventional superiority to Iran, and if you if you one can go through that, it takes an, an hour or so in in detail. But briefly, what it consists of is geography, because the Iranians are constrained in what they can move west of conventional forces, and anything that they do move west, you see mounting in the desert, and you can even hit them beyond the, their mountains. And whatever they get through has to go through the Iraqi, uh, this area of Iraq, which is, everything is north-south. Canals, rivers, roads, everything. And then and meanwhile, there are swamps and lakes. The Saudi Air Force is very good and very big. And this would be a World War I killing field for Iranian conventional forces. So Saudi Arabia is not worried about Iranian conventional forces 
uh, as much as it is if Iran becomes nuclear equipped, then the game changes completely. Uh, then the next example is uh, Syria, and we have that right now. now certainly you're familiar with the, um, uh, the, the tokamak principle in which you take a, um, a magnetic field or a, uh, some sort of uh, uh, containment and you put deuterium in the middle and you bombard it from all sides to compress it in order to get a fusion reaction or to try to get a fusion reaction. Uh, a, any nuclear uh, weapon has a, a sphere of explosives surrounding the nuclear material and they all go off simultaneously, which is why timers are so important in, in, in making a nuclear weapon. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we, we let our timers be sold all around the world. But anyway, our very advanced timers. But if the, uh, that principle of compression and make, to make an uncontrolled nuclear reaction, which makes a nuclear explosion, is a gift to us in Syria. In that, if you look at the map, you see that, just think about this, we and the French are protected by probably European uh, surface combatants who have carriers in the Mediterranean. We could have carriers in the Red Sea, we have carriers in the Persian Gulf. We have our base, our big base at al uh, And then you could have the uh, Turks, even if they didn't participate, again, as a barrier. The Kurds, who would not be able to participate if the Turks participated, and the Turks who could not, would not participate if the Kurds participated, would take your pick, would also be a barrier. Uh, coming in from Iraq would be the Iraqis who are fighting the, uh, not the Shia, but the, the ones who are fighting um, uh, ISIS. Uh, and so nothing would happen there. And then from the south, you have Israel in the southwest, as a barrier, and possibly a participant if things started to spill over, certainly an intelligence participant. You have the whole Jordanian army and air force here, and you have the uh, air component from the Gulf states and the US and our European allies, and then you have Saudi forces and an Egyptian uh, expeditionary force hardened by uh, participating sort of uh, stays of European and American forces. And Syria becomes a, uh, like one of those nuclear weapons where it's all sides, completely surrounded by immense pressure. The, the object of that, and you'd have to have big, a big force, would be to um, take all of this area, and it could be easily done, by the way, if the, if the Turks were to move south and the forces, Egyptian, et cetera, move, move north, and then you move west. The object would be to isolate al-Assad and the Russians in a coastal enclave. Probably the Russians would then leave because they wouldn't think it worth the, the risk to have that, and you could put Assad in a cage, and there would be uh, uh, peace in Syria because the, uh, uh, the, the, those, it takes a very large amount of force to do that. And we could have done this a long time ago. We could have, certainly I mentioned before during the 2003, we could have done something similar. Uh, the problem would be Russian airlift and sea lift. You would have a, an air and, uh, and land blockade here, and nothing would come from Iran or from the Shia in, in Iraq. But, and we could shoot down Iranian planes. But the question would be, what if there's a Russian airlift from there or around here? And the answer is, I think, it's not as uh, dire as one might think, because usually uh, the uh, great powers don't go into zones like that. They, they really don't, because they're somewhat afraid. And if you look back at the Cuban Missile Crisis, part of the reason that we, we were able to uh, settle the Cuban Missile Crisis as we did was because of our nuclear superiority at the time. But I think most of the reason was that we had immense conventional superiority around Cuba. 
And in this case, we would have immense conventional superiority around Syria, and I don't think that the Russians would risk it. Also, shooting down a, a Russian plane or the Russian shooting down one of our planes does not mean nuclear war necessarily, although it might be used by Putin as an excuse to invade the uh, Baltic republics. But uh, this is a, a very uh, sticky, complex problem. Perhaps we're going too far. Now I just want to uh, finish up with the necessary conditions uh, precedent for success and in order of ascending importance. First, it might be a surprise in that it's kind of, it's not, it's not abstract, it's very simple, it's very practical, but it's something we haven't done that we could do, which is strategic mobility uh, writ very, very large. Uh, this becomes a force multiplier uh, extraordinaire. Uh, for instance, in 2003, if we had had the Gulf War Army, everything would have been different. Uh, we wouldn't have failed at all. Uh, now, you can, you can correct the degradation of forces only by reconstituting them, and that should be done, and I'll get to that in a second, but a way exists to accelerate that by orders of magnitude, which we just haven't done, which is the ability to move forces very, very quickly and at will. If you think about it, that was what Marlborough did. Uh, that was Napoleon's secret in his early years, and no one had ever marched troops as, as quickly as he did, in Europe anyway. And it was extraordinary, the, his enemies were always surprised, where do they come from? Where are these people coming from? It was something new at the time, although Marlborough had done it on a smaller scale beforehand. Um, think of uh, Knox moving the cannon from Fort Ticonderoga to Dorchester Heights in Boston. The British had no idea that there, suddenly they look up and in Dorchester Heights, there would be all these cannon, and they, they, they evacuated Boston. They had to, and it was an extraordinary feat what he did. Um, Patton also, uh, not just crossing France with the Third Army, but what he did at the Battle of the Bulge, it completely surprised the Germans. They did not believe that they could move 100 miles in the snow, uh, more or less in a day, um, or a day, two days, whatever it was. And then, of course, Israel. It's Israel's watchword is fast movement. Now, we, we could ostensibly do that. Let me give you some numbers. In 1990, we had 50 Army and Marine Corps division equivalents. I say equivalents because we've long broken up our divisions. We don't have just a division structure. We have all these combat teams and various independent units, etc. But if you put them all together, uh, we had about 50 division equivalents. And now we have 25. This is half the number. So that's one thing in itself. It, but in, in terms of C5A, C17, or C130 equivalents, that is airlifters, in 1990 we had 880, or now we have 303. Now, granted, the, the newly uh, upgraded C5A is much, much better than the old C5As. The C17 is better than anything we had then. Um, and the C-130s even have been upgraded with new propellers and engines and stuff, many of them. But uh, we don't have enough to move what we should be able to move as quickly as we should be able to move it. Think of this. Let's say that we could put five divisions right here in northern Jordan in a week. That's extraordinary because it's, 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 it's like having many more divisions than we actually have. Because with the ability to move these fast, for instance, if we had to move them to Korea, we might be able to move them to Korea in 10 days. And this would take a World War II-like army, when, you know, and they had thousands of bombers that would go over Germany and, and, the, and, the, and the European continent. It might take 1,000 uh, big airlifters. Okay, but the advantage would be an order of magnitude in the ability to place troops, uh, and in a sense, an order of magnitude, magnifying just the number of troops that we, that we have. Uh, so that is something that we should spend money on, but we, but we don't. Um, three sm small things, and then we can have Q&A. The, the next thing is the correct provision of forces. For 50 years, for 50 years, I have been reading about the uh, high-load debate. 
for those of you who don't know, it's a question of what kind of forces should we have? For instance, with the Navy, we have big aircraft carriers or big, uh, we don't call them cruisers anymore, they are cruisers, but they're, you know, we call them uh, destroyers, the big destroyers like the Zumwalt. Um, you know, very capable ships that are extremely expensive and can do a great deal. Or a lot of little ships that are limited in their capacity, but there's lots of them, so they can be in many places, et cetera, et cetera. And if one is hit, it's not that big a deal because uh, we have many of them. But the, the thing about that is it's not a choice. You cannot, if you, if you reduce that, if you reduce that uh, requirement to a choice, then essentially you are bound to fail because you can never know, you can never predict what kind of war you're going to be fighting. And the answer to it is you need both in great numbers, in as great numbers as you can, as you can possibly uh, arrange. Um, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, again, it's like the thousand ship navy. It's a comfort to people who don't want to face the real question, which is we have to spend more. That brings us to military spending. And let me give you three examples of this. This would be um, uh, Japan, Israel, and China. Or China, as uh, someone says. Um, what was it that, what exactly was it that enabled a feudal society where uh, you know, the samurai relied, relied upon their, their swords in a few decades to become a power that was sufficient to defeat a major European power at Tsushima, that is, the, the Russians, uh, sink the Russian fleet. How could they do this in, in, in a matter of uh, decades, just a few decades? And then, jumping ahead, how did Israel, which if, I, if we went through the figures, you'd see it was, it was just pathetic compared to the Arab armies arrayed against us. How did they manage uh, through uh, 67, even, even now, because they're, they are outgunned in terms of, of weapons, even now, although their weapons are qualitatively better, usually. Uh, how did they do it? And then the next question is, how did China uh, come from a, uh, a place where, you know, it just uh, it with, certainly within a living memory, not that long ago, it was a, a place of peasants and, and, um, and water buffalo, to leading us in certain military categories and very quickly approaching a military parity. I, I think already regional parity in, in Asia, if not, if not uh, more than parity, and uh, approaching real parity in the next uh, five or 10 years. How do they do this? Well, in the, first, in the, in the Japanese case, they had a slogan and the slogan was uh, in Japanese called Fukoku Kyohe, which was taken from a Ch an ancient Chinese slogan. And what it was was their intuitive understanding of the relationship between economic growth and military uh, prowess, military spending, if you, if you must. Um, and they didn't understand it in mathematical terms. They just had an intuitive understanding of it, the way that the Ancient Chinese must have had an intuitive understanding. Not, not economic power, not wealth, but economic growth. Israel then um, quantified that, approaching it scientifically, and they understood exactly how it worked, and they put it to work. And then China, either taking a leaf from Israel or figuring it out themselves, because originally they had the original slogan, understood mathematically how this works. Uh, it's very complicated, but I have compressed it, and I will just give you an example. If you compress the figures from 1988 to 2016, China uh, averaged a GDP growth of 8.95%. This lifted its GDP from 274 billion to 11.4 trillion a 41-fold increase. The per capita GDP was, in 1988, was $256. By 2016, it was $8,261, a 32-fold increase. This enabled military spending, and I quote you figures in purchasing power parity, 
to rise from 5.78 billion in 1988 to 210 billion in 2016, a 36-fold increase. Can you imagine if we had a 36-fold increase? Economic growth enabled higher uh, per capita incomes so that the state could take a bigger share and yet the population would feel that life had improved so many, so many, by so many fold that they were still content. The Chinese did not take full advantage of this. They could have done much, much more, but they wanted to preserve social cohesion and they knew they couldn't absorb the new technology and, and the, the new structures of their military as fast as their, the, the, the potential spending would have allowed them to do. So they, they're taking it slow, they're patient, but they still had a 36-fold increase from 1988, which is tremendous. Now, I, I say this to you simply because what it means is that we, the United States, has the best combination in the history of the world of high per capita income and massive population. We can do whatever China does in that respect, the, you know, the miracle of spending, many times over. That's why in World War II, we spent, uh, 1945, we spent 40% of GNP on the military, 80% of uh, federal spending. Um, and yet, the uh, unemployment rate went from 19% average during the, the uh, Depression to 1.2%. Real personal income increased. Now, and no one's is recommending spending 40%, but my point is we have the margin. We can do this. It's a question of will. Which brings us finally to statesmanship. We do not have the statesmanship uh, that would enable us to, to vault over simple reaction and confusion that would enable us to forge a political consensus to do what is necessary to defend ourselves. I'm sorry. Uh, in a democracy, the fish does not rot from the head. The fish rots from the body up in a democracy. And the now fighting to become dominant, if not already dominant, ethos of the West is that we are the victimizers of the world and as such have no claim to self-defense or legitimate interest to defend. Not surprisingly, our rivals and enemies believe the same. The Islamists taking it further by believing that their every motive and action is the execution of God's will. Until this imbalance of the heart and mind is remedied, we will not know and we cannot know how to fight properly and defend our civilization. Thank you. This, of course, is a very sore, hot topic. In, 19, in June 1967, the USS ship Liberty, which was an uh, intelligence gathering ship, a SIGINT ship, was in the Mediterranean. And uh, it was strafed by the, by the Israeli Air Force uh, repeatedly, about three times, three passes. And it resulted in the death of about 26 uh, U U.S. sailors. How many? 34. 34 U.S. sailors. Uh, and here, here's, the, here's my analysis of that. And I try to be, you know, I'm an American first. Uh, and I'm, I'm not an Israeli citizen anymore. But uh, there were several things working here. There were several things working here. Number one. Israel had warned the United States that this was a war zone and it shouldn't have any ships in it. 
number one. Number two, uh, the ship, the Liberty, if you, if you look at the, the uh, profile, when you're in the Navy, you have a book that shows all kinds of ships, all kinds of ship uh, profiles, and it's just a little black silhouette. It looked exactly like a particular Egyptian ship, and the Israeli pilots and Israeli naval people were all aware of the whole Egyptian navy because they didn't, they, Egypt didn't have that big a navy, so they knew the silhouettes of the ship, and the Liberty looked like that. Uh, number three, uh, the Israelis, and I, this I know, and this I have been uh, uh, a part of, Israelis shoot first and ask questions later. Uh, this is part of the ethos of the Israeli army and part of being outnumbered. When they go into the attack, they, they just attack, you know, abs with absolute uh, um, savagery. Uh, number four, once they completed their strafing runs, there was a big American flag at the back of the, of the ship, at uh, the stern of the ship, excuse me. And um, uh, once, it, you know, if you're going at uh, uh, 450 miles an hour right over the water, it's hard to see things except very big things, and things happen very fast. But eventually they saw the flag and they stopped, and then Israeli MTBs, motor torpedo boats, came out to, uh, to offer aid. The people on the ship said, you know, essentially drop dead. We don't want your aid, you just killed all our men. Uh, and then the question uh, has to go to motive. The, uh, the people who say that the attack was deliberate say that the uh, Israelis wanted to prevent the U.S. from knowing the war plans in 67 because they, the, uh, they wanted to keep them secret. Well, a couple of things about that. Number one, it is, it's documented that the Israelis shared with us in ambassadorial meetings when they were about to, to, uh, to actually attack the Egyptians. Number two, they didn't even have to do that because anybody, including me, knew that when the Egyptians had paralyzed the Israeli economy for, for two weeks because they mobilized when Nasser put his forces in the Sinai, the country stopped dead. If it had continued, then the country would have been destroyed because the, you can't go for two weeks with nothing working and, and you know, no food being produced or food rotting in the fields. Uh, the hospitals close to etc. So anyone with, who was even vaguely conscious knew that Israel had to attack. So that wasn't a secret worth keeping. And then, uh, then finally, one has to look at this in context. When when uh, the uh, I believe it was the 82nd Airborne, the 82nd Airborne, was airlifted from North Africa for the attack on Sicily, we shot down. Uh, dozens of our planes and killed several hundred of our own soldiers. It wasn't because of uh, a bad intent. We didn't intend to do it. But these were American planes flying over American ships, and the, and the ships had been warned. And yet we killed so many of our soldiers. In, even now in, the, in the, uh, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, you hear of all these friendly fire incidents. And in Vietnam, all armies have friendly fire incidents. And um, what I found, have found is that the, that the Liberty Survivors uh, Organization uh, has attracted people who are unwilling to extend to Israel the same understanding that they extend to us and to all other armies uh, around the world. Uh, and the other thing is that as a uh, I was there at the time, and I was there subsequently when Israel shot down the Libyan airliner full of civilians over Sinai. Uh, and I think that the one, the, the Sinai one was different because it was a civilian airliner. They suspected at first that it was going to crash into Tel Aviv 9-11 style, uh, but it turned around. And I thought, well, you know, it, and the, the pilot instructed the passengers to pull down their shades, and they did, so you couldn't see into the plane. Uh, and the pilot wouldn't answer on the radio. So what the Air Force, and I was in the uh, control center at that time, the Air Force said um, this was a dry run. They were just seeing what we would do. And then they gave the order to shoot it down, which was horrifying 
But uh, even that was somewhat understandable. But the liberty is different. It was right in the middle of a war, and it was told not to be there. Thank you. Time for one more? If I may ask, oh, do you have a microphone, please? My name is Jean Carr. I'm, I'm a military spouse, and I've got a lot of military in the family. And so I've been very aware uh, through the different, um, what she said, situations. And the thing you mentioned was that uh, we didn't, that the generals probably didn't have as much freedom uh, during the last administration. And now the current administration, the president, has given more freedom, more, ex he's turned that over to the generals. I think that's a good thing. I, I think that the generals should have more control mm -hmm. and decision making. And I'm happy about that. Do you have some thoughts about this giving these generals really the, the uh, opportunity to make the decisions that need to be made during this time? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War was so closely run from the White House yeah. that uh, it, was, it was absurd. Um, on the other hand, the, uh, if you think about MacArthur, uh, the civilian control is, is absolutely necessary. I think that there's a kind of a continuum, and that is this. Y you have to have ultimate civilian control. We all know that. And no one knows that better than the military. And they're willing to die for it. And I cannot stand when uh, people that I speak to say, oh, well, there could be a coup, et cetera, et cetera. And these people in the military are literally willing to die for the principle of civilian control. And then they have these civilians who have never held a gun in their hand saying, uh, saying that the military is a danger because they might have a coup. Uh, they don't know the military, that's why they say that. But there, there is a continuum. There must be civilian control and superiority, um, number one. But a lot of it depends upon the skill of the civilian officials. And in the case of, uh, for example, Churchill, Churchill exerted much more influence because he was, a, a, in many cases, a much greater strategist than his generals. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, American um, presidents, let's go back to, uh, well, the first Gulf War, to George H.W. Bush. Uh, he had a much better sense of it than any subsequent president, including his son. Uh, Clinton had no idea and uh, luckily he wasn't really tested. Um, and George W. Bush, I think, was pretty much out of it in terms of, of knowing what to do, and I think his influence may have been actually uh, negative. Um, and then Obama had absolutely no idea of anything, and yet exerted, <laughs> and, and exerted tremendous control, um, it almost a, uh, Lyndon Johnson-style control. Right. Now, uh, Trump, I can assure you, has no idea, no, a absolutely none. I mean, this is a man who, uh, in, are, I'm, his, I'm the same age, so that I've been following, and I grew up in New York, so I've been following him since I was in high school. Uh, he's in all the papers, and he was always the bad boy. And in early, I think the early 80s, um, during the uh, missile crisis, or during the uh, um, salt talks, he, he was interviewed and he said, I don't understand why this is taking a year or whatever, this, this is ridiculous. He said, I could fix this in two weeks. And, and you had Max Kampelman and uh, General Rowney, and <laughs> they were addressing this very complex problem, uh, and, and there was, which in, involved a gamble and, uh, and intelligence assessments and uh, f penetrating the, the mind of the adversary, et cetera. So he said, I could do this in two weeks. And the journalist said to him, well, why? What qualifies you? And he said, well, I, I fixed the Woolman rink. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, a, for those of you who don't know, it's a skating rink in Central Park, and it kept on leaking. It, yeah. And the, the city tried to fix it, and they, they couldn't. Um, and then Trump took over, and what I think he did was devote you know, five times the resources, because he wanted to make a public relations coup, and he did fix the leak, and that's how he could, 
how he could uh, make the salt talks uh, be perfect, beautiful, in two weeks. <laughs> so he doesn't know anything about it, so it's good that he's giving control to the generals, unless you get generals who don't know what they're doing, uh, in which case uh, you know, th there are many. And uh, let me just say this, that I have found that uh, understanding uh, the, the military situations and strategy is a gift like the gift of music. You can, you must, and you, can, you have to, you must learn it and work at it. But if you don't have it, you don't have it. And unfortunately, most generals do not have it. So they, what they've done is they've done the work and they come out with very, very uh, uh, Sir John French-like ideas of, you know, for those of you who don't know, if there are any, he was the British general of World War I, who's responsible for the, the, the deadlock and the massacre of countless millions of troops because he just couldn't see what was going on. Um, the, the, unfortunately, military professionals, like many professionals, do not have the gift. So you have to get good generals. And uh, I, th I think that, uh, from my knowledge, that uh, General Mattis is a very good man, and he will, he will uh, um, probably be influential in promoting people who do have a natural understanding. Now, for instance, everyone uh, glorifies General Petraeus, General Petraeus of the Surge. You know what I think of the Surge. Uh, so, OK. Another one? Another question? Or, yeah? Way, way in the back that. Um, the question will be quick. I don't know if the answer will be quick or not, but um, thank you for a terrific presentation for starters and uh, for the comprehensiveness of uh, your analysis. One thing that you didn't talk about explicitly that I'd be interested in your thoughts on is the, the somewhat intangible factor in military culture and the implications that it has for readiness as well as ultimately for success. Mm -hmm. And if you would, just address how it looks to you, having served in a number of different uh, military units, um, that we are now, you know, with the legacy of Obama, uh, well along in a huge social engineering experiment in the United States mm -hmm. military, and what that means for all the other analyses that you've just given us. Sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, th there's an essential principle, which is that the, the role of the military is to defend the United States, is not to be a social laboratory, no matter what you think of one way or another. Uh, secondly, so it was Susan Rice who said that having transgender people in the military, and of course there's no such thing as transgender. It's actually right. physically impossible. It's, it's no such thing. It's a, it's a fantasy. You can have a man who, who takes hormones and develops breasts. You can have a, uh, and has his uh, genitals cut off. You can have artificial vaginas um, uh, plowed into somebody. You can do this and that, but you cannot change the chromosomes and you cannot change the internal uh, plumbing. Uh, so, so it's a fantasy. And Susan Rice said, it is a matter of military necessity that we have transgender individuals in the armed forces. Now, what necessity that could be, I don't, I don't know. But I can tell you another thing. I, I just learned from uh, listening to, uh, some of you may have heard of Dr. Jordan Peterson in Canada. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, in Canada, uh, if you do not address someone by their chosen pronoun, <laughs> such as um, G or sheer or whatever, and even people who say that they don't fit on the male-female spectrum or the human spectrum, and they call themselves otherkins. Uh, otherkins. Yeah. If if you don't address them according to their chosen pronoun, which could change the next day, by the way, you can go to prison because it was made uh, an article of. It's brought into hate crimes. It's hate speech and hate crimes, and that's punishable by, by prison in Canada. But we're going along that road. Uh, to answer your question, uh, there is uh, nothing, uh, I think, as bad for morale as to be uh, the subject to that kind of, of uh, social um, crazy experimentation. Uh, 
Uh, and I know that uh, in the units in which I served, um, there were some examples of that uh, which really affected morale. I can't get into it, but I, as, as, as just uh, hinting at it, for refusal to commit a certain act, uh, and I would have died rather than have done this, I had to sweep the, the ground, the dirt ground, for three days steady because I wouldn't uh, cotton to something. And uh, so many good people are driven out. Uh, so many uh, bad people are, are pulled in because of, because of this. And I'm not suggesting that people, because of their whatever their sexual orientation, can't fight. Um, I am suggesting that I don't think that a, a country that puts pregnant women in combat uh, is going to last very long. Uh, I'll tell you that. Um, I was in the Israeli army. I served under Golda Meir. I was delighted to do so. Uh, there were some female officers over me, but they weren't combat officers. And, and I protected um, uh, one of the most uh, wonderful things in my life was to be on the northern border with Lebanon protecting a whole camp full of female soldiers. And I felt very protective uh, against them. And I saw that they were different from the, the, the men who protected them. They just were. I mean, that's experience. I can't quantify it or anything. But our sense of fighting was totally different from theirs. And I, and I saw it actually sometimes in action. So, OK, thank you so much. Thank you.